come down to the side here. Take a while to get down. Okay. Right here. Right. What we've done is taken a big blanket, we've pleated it at the back, and we cover up right above Sorry, no offence. <laughs> sure you're a lovely person, but we just have to hide you for a moment or two. Right. We then take the, uh, the belt and belt in the middle. Still there? Okay. <laughs> right, could you belt this in so it's reasonably tight, but not so tight you can't breathe? Because being able to breathe, I'm told, is an important thing. <laughs> Because that's 100% of people have died from lack of breathing. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Remember, what I'd like to do is stand up, please. Do you want a hand? You alright? Young people, they don't need help, Bob. <laughs> nails. Okay. As you can see, she's wearing a dress, right? Now, you're a girl, so you're allowed to wear a dress, okay? But in Scotland, if you're a boy wearing a dress, people laugh at you, right? So what we have to do is we have to get rid of some of the excess material at the front because if you're trying to climb up a hill just now there's a reasonably high chance you'd stand on the front of your kilt and that would be problematic. So what we do is we put a little fold in it, here, and then if you tuck that into your belt somewhere, somewhere in there, there you go. And then we do the same on the other side, there you go, tuck that in as well. And now you can see what we've got is something similar to the garment that I'm wearing in that it has two aprons, one apron, two apron, never lift your second apron, you'll get arrested. Uh, and it stops somewhere around the knees, okay? It doesn't have to be exactly on the knees on a traditional kilt, but it does on a modern kilt, right? So this is a modern small kilt, and this is a copy of what the army wore for hundreds of years, okay? It stops at your belly button and your knees, okay? If it's too low down, it's too long, you're wearing a dress. If it's too high up, again, you get arrested. Right. <laughs> Traditional kilt, there's more flexibility in it, okay? Now, are you right-handed or left-handed? Right. Okay, you hold your right arm out. What we do is sometimes if we have to do a, like, a bit of fighting or something like that, you might have to take a quick step back and you have the same problem at the back as you did at the front. So we have to get rid of the tail of the kilt. Okay, so we pass a little bit through here. Now, if you hold that at your left shoulder there, we take another bit of the kilt tail, and we pass it over the left shoulder, and then we attach it together at the top. Now. You can use a brooch or a bit of leather or something like that. I use a bit of elastic, it's a bit easier that way. And it gives you the general idea. This is the sort of thing you would see in films like Rob Roy and for some reason Braveheart. Uh, all the materials gathered up over the left shoulder. This allows uh, the sword arm, the right arm, to move freely without getting caught up in the material. Okay, so, how old are you? You're a big girl, right? <laughs> she is. <laughs> now, there might be times that you might have to defend the honour of, well, in this case, you're probably your dad. Right? <laughs> he looks like he gets himself in trouble a lot. So, I do. What you do is take that in your right hand. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Feels good, right? Mm -hmm. The power. <laughs> now, when William Wallace and Robert the Bruce were running around Scotland, they used one of these, right? This is a medieval arming sword, right? It's got two edges and a pointy bit at the front, okay? Because realistically, there's two things you can do with a sword. You can cut with it, hacky hacky, or you can thrust with it, pokey pokey. <laughs> Simple enough, right? Now, there's three ways of holding a sword. This is the most commonly uh, way to hold a sword if you hand a sword to an ordinary individual, right? But you're holding it like this, right? Yeah. Well, you're holding it like this. It's really heavy. Uh, but it's very good for the cut, but rubbish for the thrust, because you can't get a straight line from the point to your shoulder. Right? There's always a sort of V shape. What happens is you hit them, and instead of it going into them, it slides up the front. Right? Or you just look a bit silly, and that's not great. Then there is the ice pick grip. Do we have any fans of The Witcher TV show? With big Henry Bum Chin Cavill? Yeah. yeah. He holds his sword like this because he's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no offence. He looks great, his hair is all sort of woo, but this is the only two moves that you actually have, right? It's not that great. I mean, kind of looks like you go this, but now do you trust me? Full, no, <laughs> right. This is my full reach, right, in the ice pit grip. You'll notice my legs are not moving, my top half's not moving, all I'm doing is changing where my arm is, my hand is, and all of a sudden, I've got another eight inches of travel on my sword, right? That is why the ice pick grip is really dumb. You're reducing your range. 
and range matters. That's why they kept getting longer swords, because they wanted to keep the bad guy far away. The third way to hold the sword is in what we call the saber grip. So you take it from the hammer grip, you move your thumb up the back of the blade, and that's you in the saber grip. You're basically pinching it between these two fingers, right? The other ones are just there to give it a little bit extra support and control. Now, this sword is quite light, it's quite quick to grab a hold of, but the downside is your hand's vulnerable, right? Whereas this sword here, you'll notice, has a metal basket around the hilt, which is why it's called a basket hilted broadsword, right? It's called a broadsword because it's fatter than the other sword that was being used at the time. This is a rapier, right? This is a very poke centric sword, which is why all the protection's at the front. Whereas this one, the protection's all around because you do both cutting and thrusting. So the way that we use this is we hold it out in front of us with a point towards our enemy's eyes because that happens. <laughs> Nobody wants a sword in their face. And we do what's called a cut from the wrist known as a moulinade, right? Now, I'm going to teach you how to do a moulinade, mm -hmm. right? Because <laughs> I want to teach you how to kill people. <laughs> if you've got a sword in a dueling situation, of course. And if I shout at so, you. What I'll do is I'll do, I'll do it with the stick first to make it easier for you to see, right? So my thumb's up the back of the blade and the blade is pointing towards the other person's eye. I rotate my thumb down and you'll notice the blade starts to move in a big circle, right? All I'm doing is making that into a full circle, oh. right? You'll notice that my shoulder and my elbow are not moving very much. It's all in the wrist, okay? Why is that? Because if you do this, all of a sudden, all this bit here is vulnerable to getting attacked. Where if it's out in front, right, they, can't, they still can't get to me. Even if they attack me when I'm halfway through my circle, this big basket here, all I have to do is go, uh, and all of a sudden, I've got protection again, right? So do you think you can do that? Or do you want a lighter sword? Would you like a lighter sword? You want lighter a lighter sword, sword right? How about this one? Yeah. Yeah, that one better? Cool. So, get your thumb up the back of the blade here. That's it, you pinch it there. Okay, so we start here, right? We go, right? That's what we do. Right, that circle there, <laughs> yes. When you get it good, right, that cut there will cut somebody from the top of their head to their sternum down here in one slice. You don't need big two handed battle axes to cause havoc in Scotland. One of these is plenty good enough. Now, the, the Scots are not always fighting duels for the honours of dads, okay? <laughs> Sometimes we fight uh, against other Highlanders and we take one of these with us. This is called a targe, right? It's a small wooden shield covered in leather, brass studs, two straps on the back. This one is an extra one for carrying it. What we do is we pass our hand through one strap and then hold on to the second one, right? It means if you drop your, so your strap, you're, it's still there. You can swing it about the place until you get yourself protected again. Right, do you want to carry this? Yeah. Uh, on your left arm, there you go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, everything suddenly gets a bit heavier. <laughs> Everybody in the Highlands carried one of these, probably most of Scotland as well. This is called a dirk, right? It's a little stabby blade. You're not going to get this one because it's actually sharp, right? <laughs> or mostly sharp. But, uh, it was very often seen point down in the left hand. Okay, two good reasons for that. It means if somebody gets too close to your shield, with the blade tip, tip sticks out the bottom, you can maybe poke with it. Get back, I'll come to you in a minute, mate. What's that? <laughs> right? It also means if you drop or break your main sword, you don't have to sort of look around for your knife, which might be flapping about. It's right in your hand. You learned how to clap really early in life, didn't you? Because getting your left hand to your right hand is dead easy, right? So all you do is you go stab him in the face, right? Take his sword, he doesn't need it anymore. <laughs> now, the government soldier in the Jacobite uh, warfare didn't use this sort of stuff. The Highlanders, the Jacobites did, but the government didn't. They used a different weapon system. They used one of these. Now guys, this is a toy, okay? Nobody's hurt, gonna get hurt, <laughs> unless I throw it at you, in which case the person left of you needs to worry, right? This is a flintlock pistol. Flintlock musket works the same, it's just bigger, right? To load this, you go into your pouch, take out a, a cartridge. It's just a bit of wax paper with lead, black powder at the bottom and a lead ball at the top. You put the lead ball into your mouth, you bite down it and you tear it off. So where we get the English phrase to bite the bullet, something that's unpleasant but necessary. Take a little bit of your black powder, put it into your pan, you've now primed your pan. Upend the weapon, pour everything else out of the barrel, spit the bullet after it. 
Yeah. You take out your ramrod, I can't because mine's a toy. Just a little metal plunger, push everything down to the bottom, you're now almost ready to fire. You take it from the half cock position to the full cock position. So where we get the English phrase, going off half cocked. Because if you pull the trigger on half cock, nothing happens, someone hits you in the face with a broadsword. You then point in general direction at the enemy and pull the trigger. The dog head, this bit here, jumps forward and hits the prison. The little bit of flint in the dog head causes a spark. Spark lands in the pan, you get a flash in the pan. The fire travels through a small hole in the barrel called the touch hole and ignites the main powder. The, ra the main powder explodes. The rapid expansion of gas, which is what an explosion is, pushes the lead ball eh, over there towards your enemy. And I do mean eh, over there towards your enemy, right? <laughs> These are not accurate weapons, guys, right? A flintlock musket, so the bigger version, was lethal at 300 meters. It was accurate at 50. That meant if all you guys were standing in front of me and I was 50 meters away shooting at you, aiming at this poor lady here, sorry, not because you're German, just because you were there and wearing a bright top, <laughs> right? One of you guys was in trouble. Probably not you. You've been standing like <laughs> Two finger wave, that's what we do in Britain. Bye, Peter. <laughs> I like Peter, he's fun. <laughs>